My first point this evening is a saviour with a secret. A saviour with a secret. Every portion of God's word is rich with instruction. But I don't know about you, I always find parts of the scriptures, which, particularly in the Gospels of course, which deal with the saviour's spiritual experimental life. I always find those portions of God's word deeply interesting, but also um, eye-opening. You're dealing here with the Saviour. You're dealing here with the Lord Jesus Christ, who is very God, very man. By that we mean, in his nature, he possesses all the attributes of divinity. And yet, in his humanity, he possesses all the qualities that make him truly human. One person, two natures. And we read that this man, this God-man, this saviour, he prayed. In verse 35, we read, he prayed as a matter of priority. It was in the morning, but Mark stresses it was very early in the morning, because it wasn't just in the morning, it was in the morning before daylight. This in therefore makes the time between three o'clock in the morning and six o'clock. And our Lord has had a very busy Sabbath day. This is Sunday morning, of course. The Sabbath day was Saturday for the Jewish people. So on a Sunday after a day of ministering in Capernaum, casting out the demon in the, in the synagogue, healing his mother-in-law, and then dealing with all those crowds that we saw last week and today, you would think at the time when he most needed physical rest, at the time when he most needed to sleep, he arose early and interrupted his sleep to pray. Now I find that... Unbelievable, unbe unbelievable to see. I, I, I find myself utterly bewildered that a sinless saviour who did all that he did would be so desperate in his dependence on his father. If, if you've ever prayed at such a time, I'm not, not going to say therefore we should all rise every day between three and six. I remember reading about the disciplines of people like George Whitfield and trying it and I nearly got very ill. Um, we all have different constitutions and temperaments the point, though, is that Jesus expresses here a dependence on his Father. But, of course, if men are getting up at this time, that shows you that they must feel a real desperate need to pray. He is a marvel, isn't he? He's fully God, fully man, mighty God, Prince of Peace, Creator, Sustainer and Provider. And yet, fully man, he grew tired and he had needs and he prayed. I've mentioned it so many times because it's always stuck in my mind. But I'll never forget that line of Jeff Thomas when he says, Prayer is impotence laying hold of omnipotence. Prayer is weakness seeking God's strength. Prayer is a sense of one's powerlessness laying hold of almighty power. That is what prayer is. Prayer is calling on God. Prayer is the, the hum, human weakness crying out and, and, and seeking God to meet the need of the soul and the body. And here you have the Son of God, the Almighty, desperately calling on the Almighty. This is a mystery, isn't it? What kind of man are we dealing with? And you say, well, why did he need to pray? Was he not God? Indeed, he was. Does he not have the divine resources all at his disposal? I mean, he casts out demons. He heals the sick with a word or with a touch. Why did he even need to pray? Well, we know that his divine resources were not at his disposal to use whenever he felt like it. Now, it might be news to some of you. It was news to me when I first uh, learnt about this and studied this topic. I just assumed that the Lord Jesus Christ, because he was the Son of God and he did miracles to prove he was the Son of God, he just went around proving that he was God by just turning on these miracles like turning on a tap. But that, that is not the case. In fact, we read in Philippians 2 in these well-known verses, which we're actually, we've arrived at in Philippians when we come back to that. But it, it says here, Let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, and it's this statement here, our version says, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. I must confess, it's a very confusing statement. Um, what it's saying is, is that, he did not see the divine attributes of God, the glory of God, as something for him to hold on to. 
to hold as his, as his right to use, as God has the right to use them whenever he wants. He did not see it as his entitlement and his right. He was not seeking to hold on to these things, but rather he made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. What this means is, though he was fully God, he was fully man, and therefore if he did anything with divine power, he must receive it at the permission of the Father. And that changes the way you view Christ and his obedience and his accomplishments. All that he did, yes, with almighty power, he did as a man dependent on God, asking God for the power to do those things. The divine, res- the divine power of the previous day, he didn't do it at his own leisure. We are dealing with a man who did these things as a dependent man, looking to God for the strength and the empowering to do what the Father had given him to do. Now, this is humbling, isn't it? How humbling for the Saviour. Have any of you known, maybe some of the older ones know this every day, that the frustration of not being able to do things you used to be able to do? I remember my old man, he only stopped playing football in his 60s, literally very recently. But I remember him saying to me, and you know, he was a reasonable player, an amateur player when he was younger. And I remember him saying to me, you know, I know what I want to do up here, but my legs, <laughs> they, they don't respond to what my brain is saying. And there's something deeply frustrating about it. Have you ever met someone or spoke to someone with the early onset of dementia when they're conscious of what's happening to them? Um, I have, it's when the, I'm talking about the early stage, when they're aware, they know that they're not, and it's very deeply frustrating that they can't think or act as they used to. It's power, it's something suffocating, isn't there, about having the ability or having had the ability and yet totally not being able to do what you've always done. How unbelievably humbling it must have been for the Son of God who spoke all things into existence, the very word of God, having to rely on God in answer to prayer for everything that he did and said. This is a mind-blowing thought. Maybe you've not thought about it like this, but you know in Hebrews 11, that great hall of fame, men and women of faith, Moses, Abraham, Noah, Enoch, Gideon, Sarah, etc. Have you, sometimes the chapter divisions are unhelpful. They're helpful finding your place in the Bible, I'll grant you that. But they disconnect things. Because look how it continues. Imagine there was no chapter divisions because there weren't when the apostle first wrote Hebrews. Imagine, see how it continues into chapter 12. Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses... Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus was the man of faith par excellence. It wasn't Moses. It wasn't Abraham in that sense. Christ on earth had to live a life of faith. Have you ever thought about it like that before? Because faith is the conviction of unseen things. Faith is trusting your father, trusting God's revelation, trusting God, in his case, that the joy that was set before him, trusting that his his father would not abandon his soul to Hades, would not allow his flesh to see corruption, that as he kept to the path that the father had laid before him, that God would keep his every word. He was a man then, like you and I in that sense. That just as you and I can't do a single thing towards God, apart from the provision that God makes in his grace, it was no different for the Saviour. Now I think there's reassurance in these words that he went to a solitary place and there prayed. Because... When we have difficult circumstances, when we are 
perplexed when we are in situations beyond our power to go on and we've all been there and maybe you're there now. Ultimately, I believe God is teaching us to walk the way of the Saviour. God is teaching us that as he lived by continual, daily, moment by moment, dependence on his Father, so must we. But how instructive are these words? He's, he's busier than ever. I mean, I would be counselling a, a brother or sister in this situation. I would be saying, you've had a busy day, have a lay-in. And, and we can be sure that Jesus needed to sleep. Maybe that's why he found it so easy to sleep on the boat in the storm. Yes, he trusted his father. That's one of the reasons. But perhaps that's because he had this such rigorous prayer life and activity that he had to take sleep on other occasions. He was so exhausted that not even a storm could wake him up. I remember my mother coming to a football game with me in the, in the louder end of the stadium. And she slept through the whole event. <laughs> I said, I'm not wasting money on you again at a football game. She was exhausted because she was awake all the rest of the time. She was a busy woman, my mum. And she could sleep anywhere. And our Lord, I believe, was a man who had such a busy life that he knew what it was to be utterly exhausted. And yet here what we see is that our Lord models something for us. And again, don't feel the burden of legalism which says, the way I be like Christ, I mean it may mean this for you, is I've got to get up at three in the morning tomorrow and pray. No, but what Christ does model for us is that he understood primarily that the fundamental need of a man or a woman, the fundamental, the, the, the first the thing of first importance is strength from God. It's strength from God. The great need we have in our lives is before anything else, before food, before drink, is, is God himself. Refreshing strength from God. Now actually, I've been meditating on this a little bit. Um, and I was helped by a sermon that I providentially read this morning that was put into my path by a friend. He sent it to me on how faith actually has an impact on the body. Spurgeon, in this sermon, refers to John Wycliffe. Listen to this. This is what Spurgeon says, the Prince of Preachers. He says, I cannot but think that when honest John Wycliffe, raising himself up in the bed of sickness, said to the monks who surrounded his couch, Expecting him to die and tempting him to recant, he said, quote, I shall not die, but live to declare the wicked deeds of the monks. Spurgeon says on this, I cannot but think that his faith had much to do with his cure. He had been, given, he had been a man of timorous, wavering frame of mind. So had he been a man of timorous, wavering frame of mind, his sick bed might have been his deathbed. But the vital forces were all thrown into energetic action by the mental energy of his faith and the crisis was safely passed. We are body and soul. And actually it is true, you read the Psalms, you read about David when he was under conviction of sin. He, took, he actually describes physical symptoms to reflect an inward reality. Now there's a mystery here. But what I think Christ shows us is that he understood that strength Really, real inner man strength comes from God. And when God, it's like Paul says, isn't it? He says, what do he say? Our outward man is perishing. Yet, our inward man is being renewed day by day. You read Paul's travels, sleepless nights, shipwrecks, hunger, nakedness and famine. Yet elsewhere he says, I work harder than any man and any caveats, yet not I, but the grace of God working in me. Spurgeon goes on to say, and I think this applies to the present hour that we're in. If it meant, if it meant something at the hour when he was, he, he speaks about the church's weakness and we laugh, don't we? But he felt the times were weak in his day. What would he say about us? But he says, quote, the church's weakness springs mainly and mostly from a want of faith in her God and in the revelation which God has entrusted to her. When men believe intensely, they act vigorously. And when their principles penetrate their very souls 
and become precious to them as life itself, then no suffering is too severe, no undertaking too laborious, and no conflict too heroic. They will enter upon impossibilities, laugh at them, overcome them, when once they know of a surety that the principles which move them are most certainly from God. And so when Christ spoke boldly to the Pharisees, when Christ cast out the demons, we've got to get out of our minds, oh, he's just doing this because he's God. You are witnessing a man who goes and prays like this in desperation, says, Father, give me strength for tomorrow's work. Show me what you want me to do. And in every moment, if, if you want me to heal someone, give me the knowledge of that and give me the power to cast out the demons. That is the secret of all that Christ did. We read the following account, getting ahead of ourselves, is that a leper was cleansed. And we won't get ahead of ourselves for that passage. But suffice to say, leprosy was a, was a terrible thing in Israel. An incurable disease. And here our Lord was no doubt praying about this and seeking wisdom from his Father. Isn't it amazing that God, the God-man, saw his chief need as God? One of the reasons he may have been praying is that I believe quite likely he was under great temptation here. That's why he went to the wilderness, to a solitary place. Some versions translate it as wilderness. Because his fame is spreading everywhere, isn't it? Verse 28. He has had great success. The crowds are flocking to him. We know that because of what the disciples say next. Everyone is looking for you. Now, he's got an opportunity now to to build a platform, hasn't he? To increase his popularity, to continue to do things that would wow people <clears throat> for glory without a crown, without a cross. And he goes back to the wilderness, which was what, what was the place where Satan showed him all the kingdoms of this world and says, you can have it all. You can have it all if you would bow down and worship me. And he goes back to the wilderness to remember the temptation and go to his father, Lord, it's not what I seek. I, don't, I haven't come to this world to seek praise and to seek applause and to seek a platform. I have come to save my people. Show me what you would have me do. What we are witnessing here is Isaiah 50 verse 4 played out before our very eyes. So, so it's, a, it's a wonderful verse speaking of the Messiah. This is the Messiah speaking in verse 4. The Lord God has given me the tongue of the learned, that I should know how to speak a word in season to him who is weary. Here it is. He awakens me morning by morning. Morning, He awakens my ear to hear as the learned. So when you read in the Gospels of him speaking as no man spoke, you read these um, tremendous words. He learnt that from his father. The father taught him what he was to say. The father instructed him. In order that he would have the tongue of the learned. Here is the saviour then going to Jehovah saying, what do you want me to do? Where do you want me to go? What must I do to save my people? Show me the way. And we know that Christ prayed before every important moment. He prays at his baptism in Luke 3.23. He prays all night in choosing the apostles in Luke 6.12. If he's just God and he, in a sense that he knows everything and he's got all his divine attributes accessible to him at every moment, why would you pray all night? He prayed all night, I believe, name by name. Peter, John, James, Father, are you sure? Make me know, because this is a massive decision. Judas? We know he prayed when dealing with popularity in Matthew 14, verse 23. We know he prayed when tempted in Gethsemane. So the secret, the secret of Christ's life was prayer. What an instruction. Because this is what it means to follow Christ, isn't it? If he did everything as, a, as, as God, if he just did everything because he could just tap into his divine resources whenever he felt like it, how could we follow Christ? How could we be like Christ? And yet as Paul says, follow me. As I follow Christ. What we learn then is this. Time with God is the true secret to power to serve. 
You know, I used to believe, to my shame, but it's what I was taught. I used to believe that if I just only got to a meeting and someone laid their hands on me and I just had an infusion of the Spirit, that somehow in just a moment like that, I could have power. And... But we read that they're here that there are no shortcuts to power. There are no shortcuts to usefulness. There's, no, there's, there's nothing that can take the place from a continual day by day, morning by morning, earnest seeking God for strength and grace. It's been the same, it was the same for Christ, it was the same for the apostles, it was the same for every man or woman that God has ever used. I actually think the Lord is trying to teach us about prayer at the moment because it just seems to be coming up so often, doesn't it? It came up in Nehemiah over and over again and now it's come up here. And if he sets the people praying, it's because God wants to bless that people. So the Lord is trying to teach us about prayer. We should be very excited about what God could do in our lives I'm not going to prescribe what that is. It might be some secret blessing. It might not be visible. But nevertheless, if, if we're going to be a praying people, we can expect God to bless us. J.C. Ryle, one of the better Anglicans, said, If he who was holy, harmless, undefiled and separate from sinners, thus prayed continually, how much more ought we who are compassed with infirmity? If he found it needful to offer up supplications with strong crying and tears, how much more needful is it for us who in many things offend daily? But that's the instruction of these words. Consider the encouragement of these words. Consider the power of these words. As I mentioned, everything that he does, he cleanses a leper the next day. He forgives the paralytic. He, he does all these things as God answers his earnest supplications in Christ. And it's been the same way. I, love, I was reading only this afternoon in Acts 3 and it dovetailed wonderfully with this. When Peter and John go up to the temple to what? To pray. And then they meet that blind beggar, don't they? And, and, and Peter says to them, look at us. He says, silver or gold I do not have, but what I give you in the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. And the people saw him walking and praising God. And then they say, what do they say to the people? Men of Israel, why do you marvel at this? Or why look so intently at us as though by our own power or godliness we made this man walk? I mean, so often we read the apostles and think, well, they were the apostles. This was by God's power that they did this. And then they said, the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered up and denied in the presence of Pilate. And then they go on, and it is through faith in his name has made this man strong, whom you see and know. It's prayer. They were a praying people and it was all, got all done by God's power. God could yet do great things among us if we would follow the Saviour and imitate the Saviour in this way. And again, I'm not prescribing a time to pray. I'm encouraging all of us here to the same level of dependence that Jesus had in his Father. The extent that God can use this church is not limited to our weaknesses, but God's infinite resources. How important it is for us to stop and pray at every single moment of our lives. The secret of all all blessedness and usefulness that all men and women have known of faith is the presence of God in them. We've probably heard it so many times mentioned that when Moe McShane assembled, ascended, ascended the pulpit, the people wept before he'd even got to the top. And what was the reason? Because they could tell he'd been in the presence of God. Oh, for something like that. In our time and in our day. That was what they said about the apostles. They could, they could tell that they had been with Jesus. There's no magic bullet to revival either. But earnest, serious, dependent, crying to God. As our Lord said to the disciples, Master, why couldn't we cast out this demon? This kind cannot come out except by fasting and prayers. Or you think of the, the persistent widow in Luke 18. She was heard because of her persistence. Consider the challenge of these words. So I was reading this, I was so convicted. And I thought, Tom, you are a proud, self-reliant man. How can I, I of all people, a sinner, 
not have the same dependence that the sinless saviour had. Who do I think I am? If there's anything which says in capital letters, Tom is a proud man. It is the fact that I fail in this area. Christ was a dependent man and he was a sinless man. And if I do not pray as the Lord does, what does that say? What does it reveal? It means that I am a self-reliant man. And what does that say about you as well? If there's any evidence of our pride, it is in our prayers. John Owen famously said, I think it was John Owen, he said, what a man is on his, what a man is on his knees, he is. And nothing else. A man is only what he is on his knees. There's no magic bullet in the Christian life. If you struggle with besetting sins, there's no sermon or hymn or spiritual experience that we just, we just sing and we walk out and, and we will never struggle with things again. You cannot live today on yesterday's manner. It stinketh. It's rotten. We must have continual uh, supplies of grace and strength from God. Can I put it like this? Are you backsliding? Let me put it another way. I was thinking about this and applying it to my own soul this week. If we're not praying, we're backsliding. That changes the way we think about backsliding, doesn't it? Backsliding doesn't begin when you're no longer at church. Backsliding begins in this vital matter of communion with God. If prayer is the soul seeking God... If there is an absence of prayer, we're not seeking God. And if we're not seeking God, we're backsliding from God. Dear friends, I want to say this in the right way. I find myself sometimes still missing my charismatic friends. I have to say. Not because I miss the madness. Um, they knew how to pray. They knew how to seek God. Saturday morning prayer meetings at 7 o'clock in someone's back garden shed and 40 people turn up. The pastor would call a week of prayer and fasting. Every night the building's open and a certain quota of the church would come and they do a road that every night there were people praying for the church in the area throughout the week. You know, they might have some of their theology wrong, some of them aren't converted, but some of them are and some of them love God. And I tell you what, some of the graces and the, the charity and the love and care that I met in some of these charismatic men and women. I was speaking to someone a little while back who says, I hate reformed churches. Because they're cold, prayerless, lifeless. I want to go back to churches where they seem to really know God. Now, there's so much one could say to that. And there's so much that's wrong with what that person said. And there's so much misunderstanding of what that person said. But really, what is true religion? True religion is, 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 is worship of God. True religion is, is men and women who are in love with God, seeking God. As the only, again, Psalm 24, we read it in our hearing, that the blessing is God himself. And what Christ is demonstrating for us here, that he doesn't want the crowds. He doesn't want the popularity. He doesn't want the platform. He just wants to be in the will of his God. He just wants to hear his father's voice. That's all that matters to him. You shall have no other gods before me. He's saying, Father, it is you that I seek and nothing else. Even if that means Calvary's cross. Even if that means a path of suffering. He says elsewhere, I have a baptism to, be accompl to accomplish Oh, how I am in anguish until it is accomplished. Not even the suffering that the path that God had for him could make him waver in his commitment to his father. Oh, dear friends, prayer is so underemphasized in our circles. Prayer is so neglected. I used to be a member of a reformed church that had over 100 members and about 15 came to the prayer meeting. And yet you went to that church, they would be held up as an example church for a church like us to imitate. Because they're a reformed church that's growing. And there's a lot of activity. But I believe that revelation would be aptly applied to such a church. You have a name that you are alive, but you are dead. Where there is the absence of prayer, there is no life. 
Prayer is, if you like, the pulse of true Christianity, as J.C. Wells said. Wow goes on to say, here is the true test of our state before God. Here true religion begins in the soul. When it does begin, here it decays and goes backwards. Psalm 65, blessed is the man whom thou choose and cause to approach unto thee that he may dwell in thy courts. We shall be satisfied with the goodness of thy house, even of thy holy temple. Consider also the warning of these words. P to pray is the mark of a spiritual man or woman. But there is prayer which God hears and there is prayer which God doesn't hear. There is much praying in many places of worship this evening. But not all prayer is prayer that God hears. We know that because we have that account, don't we, in Luke 18 of the tax collector and the Pharisee. We're told the Pharisee prayed, but he did not go home forgiven. But the tax collector cried out from the depth of his heart, Have mercy on me, a sinner. Dependent prayer, hungering prayer, longing prayer for God to pardon him that he might know God. How do you know that you're a true child of God? Have you ever cried from the depth of your soul to God? have mercy on you to change you I love it in Acts 9 you know when Paul is struck on the Damascus road and uh, God says to Barnabas that I want you to to meet Paul and one of the things he says he says behold he prayeth I think it says in the a version behold he prays you will find a man praying now hang on a minute Saul of Tarsus was a Pharisee of Pharisees he must have said lots of prayers over his lifetime but God says now he's praying for the very first time. Behold, he prays. It's the very nature of a child to call on their father. Oh, I know when my kids are awake in the morning, dear friends. <laughs> how, do you, how do I know? Because they call my name <laughs> very loudly. And normally it's, I want a drink. I want some cereal. I want some breakfast. I know I have children because my children call on me. The unbeliever is described in God's word as unthankful. 2 Timothy 3 verse 4. Uh, Psalm, uh, Psalm 10 verse 3 to 4. Even more vivid description of the unbeliever. For the wicked boasts of his heart's desire. He blesses the greedy and renounces the Lord to put it in Simple layman's English. He has no need of God. The wicked in his proud countenance does not seek God. God is in none of his thoughts. And so, to not pray like this is actually not to be a true Christian. And so actually, when we're talking to people and they say, they give you, you know, are you a Christian? And they say, oh yes, yes, what do you understand? Oh yes, yes, um... I, I, I believe in election, I believe in all the doctrines of grace, I believe in all these things. We need to go further. We need to say to people, have you called on the Lord from the heart? As if nothing else mattered, that it was the most important thing in the world. Save me, a sinner. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. I remember someone asking me, um, it's a really good question and I remember it's a question that I've wrestled with over the years and actually John Bunyan deals with this question he said should we encourage children of unconverted children of Christian parents to pray and you can see where this question comes from it's a reasonable question because what they're saying is, is if these children aren't regenerate if they're not born again God won't even hear their prayers should we encourage them to pray to which we have to say absolutely because they will never be saved if they don't pray to, to call on God is, in, is what it is to get saved. It's to call on God to save you. And so actually, it, it is they're not praying, which is the greatest evidence of their sin. And so we need to constantly be stressing that a man or woman is saved by calling on God. This is why giving out tracts and saying to people, say a prayer, follow this formula, is ridiculous. It's, it's, it's utterly irrelevant. The issue isn't, have you followed a formula? The issue ha isn't, have you got your words all right? The issue is, have you felt your need and said, save me? I have no other hope. But this saviour 
And you might understand very little. I remember when I first called on God saved me, I didn't understand about limited atonement. I didn't understand about election. I didn't understand about effectual call. I had no idea. All I understood was this man can take away my sin. I didn't even know how, apart from the fact that it happened because of something that happened on the cross. I didn't understand all the ins and outs of it. I didn't know what the word propitiation meant. But I knew that I had need. And I knew that he made provision. That's the Lord's secret. The longest point, because it's the most important point, I think, in this text. But secondly, see with me, a saviour determined to suffer. Simon and those who were with him, probably James and John and others, searched for him. When they found him, they said to him, everyone is looking to you. But he said to them, let us go into the next town so they may preach there also, because for this purpose I have come forth. He knows who he is. An opportunity to build a platform to achieve accolades and praise. And yet he withdraws. Why does he withdraw? I believe to regain perspective. To be reminded of his people that the Father gave to him. And to be reminded that he came to be their saviour. He will save his people from their sins. And the Father would have said to him, there's nothing more for you to do here, son. You're not called to spend time here entertaining people's curiosity for signs and wonders and, and scratching their itch. You're called to preach the gospel. You're called to preach the message. And you're called ultimately, as, you've done all of, as you do all of that, to go to Calvary's cross. And therefore we see that his mind was, I think, quite clearly, his perspective was quite clearly renewed. Because when he responds to this, this invitation or this, this exhortation, you've, you've got to come, everyone's looking for you. And for Peter and John, this is like opportunity. You're the Christ, you're the Messiah, we've left everything to follow you, and now you've opportunity, you've got a great city, everyone is looking for you. And the Lord just simply returns a backhand to them and says, no, let us go into other towns to preach. For this purpose, I have come forth. I must keep my focus on men's souls, Salvation from eternal judgment. I must preach good news. Then suffer, die and be raised. And this is guidance. We can be sure again. The Lord was being guided. Moment by moment. I don't believe. I'm sorry. You can dispute this with me if you like. But I do not believe Christ knew what was going to happen two days from now. Unless the Father revealed it to him. Because he had to trust the Lord. As we do. That's what it means to fulfill all righteousness. He had to live Man shall not live by bread alone, but every word that comes from the Father. You have to trust in God's momentary direction and provision and grace. Now, what we see here is, I wonder, I look over my life, you know, we get ourselves in the right muddle sometimes and confused and we struggle with the things that are going on in our lives and we get down and we get, speaking of myself, we get overwhelmed and we get agitated and we get... Oh, what needless burdens we carry, as the hymn says, all because we did not carry it to the Lord in prayer. Prayer is not just bringing requests to God. Prayer is the place where we meet with God. And therefore, it is in meeting with God that we find fresh perspective. Because in prayer, right, it begins, our Father who is in heaven, if you're praying and not just aimlessly saying words, if you're truly praying and, and praying with the mind and thinking about what you're praying and you recall who he is, he's the creator, he's the provider, he's the saviour, he's the redeemer, and you're rehearsing in your hearing all the great works and attributes and qualities of God and the promises of God, what the Spirit does is he settles your hearts. What the Spirit does is he renews your perspective. What the Spirit does, he says, isn't God bigger than this problem that you're praying about? Cast your cares on the Lord. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Prayer is transformative. It is in prayer we gain insight. I, I noticed from sermon preparation, um, the amount of times I've spent hours and I open up this commentary and I chuck it on the floor and I open up this one and oh, it's rubbish and, and I'm just not getting anywhere and Sunday's coming and it's Saturday night at nine o'clock and I'm like, what am I going to do? What am I going to say? And it's, it takes me three days sometimes, I'm not to be honest, sometimes it takes you a long time to think, why don't I put all the books away, get on my knees and say, God, what does this mean? What does this mean? 
And in one sense, of course, one's praying throughout, one's depending on God and one's communion with God. But sometimes it's just God's way of saying, you, the answer's not in men, the answer's with me. And then all of a sudden, it's like a, the nut cracks. And you see, and Martin Lloyd-Jones said, never ever resist the urge to pray. Prayer is the place where, I'm not saying we get revelation from God, we've got to be very careful here, we will sound like charismatics, we're not saying that God reveals new truth. But I do believe that in prayer, God brings guidance, he brings clarity, he lays things on your heart, he lays people on your heart, he, he, he does direct our hearts in prayer. That's just experimental Christianity, and if reformed people are scared of that, then um, their reformed faith isn't that of the, of the Puritans, it isn't that of the saints of the past. It was in prayer, wasn't it, where um, the Apostle Peter was on the rooftop praying and he had that vision, didn't he, that trance of the, of the great sheet and all the unclean animals in it. And, and, and he was receiving fresh insight into the situation of the day that actually God declared that the Gentiles were to be included into the church. Now, I'm not saying we get a vision or a dream like that, but, but I think the principle there is that it's in prayer that God changes us and opens our eyes up to things. Oh, what a saviour. What, what an example he is. Oh, that we would be dependent. You see, I mentioned earlier that the lack of prayer is an expression of pride. And it may be such self-reliance and pride that is why God hasn't blessed his church with revival. Duncan Campbell, to quote him again, he's been on my mind a lot lately. Some of the things he said have really challenged me. And he said, God would use us more if he could trust us. For one of the reasons he used the Lord Jesus and was pleased to exalt him was he was the most humble man that ever lived. He sought glory not for himself, but to glorify his Father in heaven, even at his own expense and public ridicule and shame and humiliation on Calvary's cross. All the way he was seeking to glorify his Father. Duncan Campbell goes on to say, let me ask you this question. Are you in the place where God can trust you with revival? He is sovereign. He is supernatural. But he comes down. And in his sovereign purpose and wise economy, he places this treasure in earth and vessels. Are you one? Or are we a group of people he can use? Are we those he can trust? And he says, are you in intimate fellowship with God? Do you see? That is, that is the qualifier to be useful to the Lord. Now what's interesting, thirdly, is we see a saviour with discernment. He, he knows why these people are seeking for him. He knows why they're looking for him. And as a human observation, you would have said it would have made sense to remain with these people. They're all seeking you. But as John's Gospel says, he did not entrust himself to them because he knew what was in man. You see, Jesus doesn't reveal himself and doesn't remain and abide with people who do not seek him for the right reasons. Our Lord says, I have gone to preach to other cities. They want me for miracles, but the miracles authenticate my message of the kingdom of man's sin, of man's need to repent. They do not care for this. They have no desire for God. They want God as a means to other ends. They don't want God as an end in itself. And again, I'm not saying we don't pray about specifics. I'm not saying we don't bring supplications. We're told to. But how much of us, how many, how many times do I, do we, what I would call, practice the adoration of God in prayer? When we open our prayers, do we start with all of our needs and do this and do that? Or do we spend time contemplating God? Say, you're so good, Lord. You're so kind. You're so wonderful to me. I love you for who you are. I love you for Calvary's cross. You see, he doesn't, he doesn't remain with such people who don't want him as an end in itself. But the positive of that is, if we want Christ for Christ's sake, if we want Christ because we want Christ, it is to such people that he reveals himself to. For thus says the high and lofty one who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy, I dwell in the high and holy place, but with him who has a contrite and humble spirit, to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. I must go then to other people to fight to see if there are any who seek good news, if there are any who are longing for this proclamation of God's love to sinners, 
And again, if there's any stirring of desire as I'm preaching this in your soul that says, oh, I, I want to know more of his love for sinners. Oh, I want to know more of his peace. I want to know more of his friendship and his companionship. Oh, I want to know more of the love of the Father. Oh, I want to know more of the communion of the Spirit. He says, for such I will send to. That's good news, isn't it? That is really good news. I think there's a number of applications to this if we're to be like our Saviour. We see here that Jesus didn't spend time with people who were using him. He blessed them. We saw that this morning because he's gracious and kind. But that he doesn't get tied up in constantly tending to people who want material benefit but have no spiritual interest. And sometimes I believe, I truly believe, Satan sends people into churches. Satan sends people our way to distract us. They have no desire to seek the God of grace. We've shared the gospel with them time and time again. We've even done much practical good to them, as our Saviour did. But they keep ringing us, and they keep making demands on us. And there comes a point when we are actually not doing them justice, nor the kingdom of God justice, by constantly doing what they want. We need to learn to be sensitive to the direction of our God, as Jesus was, and the will of God. Because you could spend all your time with these people who are using you, running rings around you, and, and there are other people. Who will actually receive the blessing and, and take the blessing. So we need to be, be mindful of that. I remember doing a Bible study, an evangelistic Bible study with one individual. He'd been at the church for many years. He'd heard the gospel over many years. I went through the whole Bible study with him. And, and, and even after some serious, intense teaching, he then said to me at the last session, what about aliens? And he said, oh, I'm really enjoying this. Can we keep meeting up? I had a decision to make. And to say no, you can be, you can be tormented. And I think it's from the evil one that says, you know, um, oh, of course, if you love him, you've got to keep going. But the problem is there were so many other people that I wanted to meet up that I hadn't spent the whole process with, with those people. And there came a point where I said, you know what? I love you and I'm always here if you need me. And if you have a genuine question, and you're genuinely wrestling with these things. But you know what? I must go and preach the gospel to other cities to use Jesus' language also. I must go and speak to other needy souls. Are we like the Lord in this? Well, the good news is Jesus bestows himself on those who want him. Now, it's very easy to hear a sermon like this and I expect some of you may be doing it because it's human nature because I would do it <laughs> if I was in this pew with you. See, I've had the benefit of thinking about this and, and thinking it. But it's, you go, oh, got another thing to do now, I've got to pray. If that's your response, you haven't heard the sermon. What we're saying is, is don't go home and go, right, I've got to write a list of, or I've got to get my diary out and think to myself, you know, I've got, some, I've got to do something. The simple challenge to this word is this, do you want God? That's the, that's the, that's the challenge, isn't it? I don't know about you, what is legalistic or burdensome about that? Do you want God? If you say yes, seek him. The evidence that you want him will be that you seek him, right? Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Seek him with all your heart and you will find him. So, so, so really, there's nothing... You, this isn't a term where you think, you know... Oh, burdens, what, that reveals more about your heart than about the exhortation. The exhortation is communion with God, just like the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't think the Lord Jesus Christ put his alarm clock on at three in the morning. I don't know what, you know, I guess we read from Isaiah that the Father awoke him and that's maybe the advantage that we had on, he has on us is that the Father awoke him to pray. Um, some of us, our alarm clocks can't even wake us to pray. But, I doubt when he was woken up, he sort of thought to himself, oh, I better pray. I, I believe he, as a man, it was an instinct to pray. Oh, to be with my father. How I long to be with him. And so the answer then to this, if you don't feel that way, is say, I mentioned it earlier in the sermon, create in me a soul first.